Section 5.5, the binomial distribution. All right, in this video, I want to introduce uh, a new formula called the binomial distribution. But before we can get to that, I need to show you a new function of your calculator, which is called um, combinations or binomial coefficients. To write them out, it looks like a fraction where we forgot the fraction bar, but it's not n over x. We would read this as n choose x and it represents the number of ways of choosing x objects from a set of n objects. So if I'm going to calculate 8 choose 3, I can do that on the calculator and I'll show you that in just a second, but what it represents is if I had a group of 8 things, let's just go ahead and make that little group over here, and I was going to choose 3 of them maybe this one, this one, and that one. That's one way of choosing three from the group of eight, but how many different ways are there that are possible? And it turns out there's perhaps more than you might think, but the way you calculate that on the calculator is fairly simple. You have to um, type things just like you'd say them. So since this is eight choose three, we're gonna hit the eight key first. And then for choose, we have to hit a couple buttons. We have to hit the math button, and then go over to the probability menu and then the choose is the NCR right here number three so I've done the eight now I'm doing choose and then I would type the three and it would tell me that there's actually 56 different ways of choosing three things from a group of eight and that by the way is even when I don't care what order they're in but just which three so that that is also um, if I count this one, this one, and that one, which may not have been the order I circled them in originally, I wouldn't count that as an additional way. Um, so that's one, and there's 55 others like it. If I do 8 choose 55, that should be the same answer, because when you choose 3 to circle, there's a sense in which you also chose 5 to leave uncircled. Well, let's go ahead and verify that on the calculator and get the extra practice. So 8 choose 5 would be 8 and then math, and then probability menu, and then down to number three, which is choose, and then put the five, and I expect to get that same answer of 56, and that's what happened. All right, and then just some other things to show you kind of the power of this. If I had 52 choose five, there's 52 cards in a deck of cards. There's five cards in a poker hand. So if someone was thinking, if I shuffle up a deck of cards and just dealt somebody five, that would be a poker hand. How many different poker hands are there? And to do that, I would just do 52 choose 5. So 52, math, probability, choose 5. And I get that there's 2,598,960. And so that kind of shows you some of the amazing capability of this choose to do some counting for us. When we're doing probabilities, uh, a lot of times we have to count different um, options. And this is something that can count millions of things very quickly for us using this formula. 51 choose 6. Some state lotteries used to have 51 numbers, and then uh, they would you would choose 6 of them, and then they would choose 6. If your 6 matched theirs, you would win the jackpot. So how many different uh, possibilities are there for 6 numbers to choose? 51. Oops, sorry, 51. Math. Probability. Choose. 6, it turns out there's 18 million different possibilities. So if you were in a state that was like this, where there was 51 numbers and you chose 6, then you would be choosing one possibility out of 18 million, and so your chance of winning that lottery would be 1 in 18 million. So it's pretty amazing that this little choose uh, item here allows us to quickly count up the 18 million different possibilities in the lottery and therefore figure out the probability of winning the grand prize. And you'd think that would be super complicated, and it sort of is, but not if you have this tool to help you out. And then finally, 100 choose 12. 100 choose 12 might be a situation where you get 100 people together for jury duty, and you're going to choose 12 of them to be on the, juror, on the jury. So how many different possibilities for juries are there when you're choosing 12 from a group of 100 who have come in for the day? So that would be 100, math, probability choose 12 
and we get what at first seems like a strange answer, 1.05. We've gotten 56 and 18 million and 2.6 million. Now all of a sudden we get a decimal, 1.05. But actually if you look over here at the E15, that's scientific notation, which means we have to move the decimal to the right 15 places. So I'm just going to write down that this is very big. And that may seem like a strange thing to write. Uh, if you want to, you can move that decimal 15 places over. I believe it is 1,050 trillion or um, one quadrillion, roughly, different juries that you can form. Um, you might wonder, like, what are we supposed to do on homework when we get a number this big? But it turns out these combinations are just a small piece in a bigger calculation. And by the time we get to our answer, this big size will have gone away to uh, result in a probability that's between 0 and 1. So... Um, don't worry about how to write these, but it, it, that would be moving it over 15 places. And again, you might want to write this one out, and when it says E72, you're probably not going to want to write that one out. So, um, we And we won't have to in the situation we're going to be using these. Alright, so the situation where these combinations are going to be handy for us is in something called repeated identical trials that are called Bernoulli trials. And they're called Bernoulli if they meet a few conditions. One of them is they have to have two possible outcomes for each trial. And we refer to those outcomes as success and failure. So S for success, F for failure. And one of the things to know right away is that success and failure are just judged based on did we see what we are looking for. And strangely enough, um, human nature as it is, a lot of times we're looking for bad things. And so a success might sometimes be a good thing. It might sometimes be a bad thing. It's a success in the sense that we saw what we were looking for. And then that's one of the conditions to be Bernoulli. Another one is the trials need to be independent. So your chance of success on the fourth try can't be affected by what's gone on on the previous three tries and, and so on. And then the final condition is the probability of success has to remain the same from trial to trial. And we use a lowercase p for the probability of success. And these are the only two outcomes, and they're complements of each other. So if the probability of a success is p, then a probability of failure would be by the complement rule 1 minus p. But we usually use the lowercase q to represent that. But the way you would get q is to do 1 minus p. So the most kind of pure example of something that is repeated trials that could be considered Bernoulli would be tossing a coin over and over again. Each time there's two possible outcomes, success and failure. Well, really it's heads and tails. Which one's the success depends on which one you're counting. If I say I'm going to toss a coin a hundred times and count how many heads I get, then heads is a success. If I say I'm going to count how many tails I get, then tails is a success. It could be either way. And the trials are independent on a coin toss, so what's happened, whether you get heads on the fifth try doesn't is not affected by the previous four tries, and every time you toss that coin, assuming it's fair, the probability of heads would be a half, and the probability of tails would be one minus that, which would still be a half. Other things that can fall into this that might not seem like they could at first would be something like taste tests. So if it's Coke versus Pepsi, that might seem clear there's two outcomes, but what if it's po Coke versus Pepsi versus 7-Up? And then all of a sudden you have three options, but it can still be considered just two options if you uh, kind of identify one of them as a success and everything else is a failure. So maybe if you, they pick seven up, it's a success, and either of the other two colas would be a failure. Similar for drug effectiveness, where if you took a drug to treat an illness, it might make you better, it might make you worse, it might just keep things as they were. And um, what a success would be might vary. You might consider success to be improvement. In other cases, you might consider success to be improvement or if things stayed the same. But as long as you identify one group as a success and everything else is a failure, you can still end up fitting this pattern. All right, so there's our setup, and we'll move to the next page and look at an example. All right, so as our example for Bernoulli trials, we're going to look at a situation where we're betting on red in the game of roulette and in a roulette um, wheel there's 18 red numbers 18 black numbers and two green numbers and all of those 38 slots are equally likely to have the ball land in them and they ask us what would be a success 
Now, typically when I ask students this, they'd say, oh, if the ball lands in a red number, um, but that's assuming that winning would be a success. A success is whatever it is we're looking for. So before you jump to that conclusion, read what they're asking you to find the probability of, and they want the probability of three wins. So we are, in fact, counting wins. So a success would be if we win, and that would also mean a success is the ball lands in a red slot. And then what is the probability of the win? Well, there's 18 red slots, and the wheel has 38 numbers on it altogether, or slots on it altogether. If you divide that out as a decimal, you get 0.4737. And then for Q, you would just do 1 minus P. And if you do 1 minus, you get 0.5263. You could also say... If the red is a success, then everything else is a failure, which would be the 18 black plus the 2 green. And if you did it that way, you'd have 20 out of 38. So you could do it as a fraction or a decimal. All right, so now let's try and find the probability of three wins in five plays. So they don't uh, mention what order this happens in. And so one of the things we've mentioned before is if something can happen in more than one way, we need to figure out the probability for every way that it could happen and add them together. So three wins in five plays could be a win, a win, a win, and then two losses where we win the first three and then lose the last two. But it could be something like two wins and then a loss, then a win and then a loss. So I've made a list here of every different possible way that you could win three out of five. And then when you start trying to calculate the probability for each of those, um, these are independent trials. So the probability of success, success, failure, failure would be the probability of success times the probability of success times the probability of success times the probability of failure times the probability of failure, or p to the third and q to the second. But if you pick a different one, like this one where you lose the first one, win two, lose one, and then win one, that means it would be q, p, p, q, p. But this is a multiplication and multiplication is commutative, which means that the order doesn't matter. And so that could be rearranged, and it's also p cubed q squared. And in fact, that's what it is for every one of these. And I said just a minute ago that if you're trying to figure out the probability of three wins, and there's many ways that can happen, you need to figure out the probability for each of the ways and add them together. Well, if every way has the same answer, then instead of adding that thing to itself ten times, we can just go ten times p cubed q squared. And then what we want to remember here in terms of the pieces, this is because we want three wins. And if you're going to play five times and have three wins, then there's going to be two losses. And then the 10 is the number of different ways it can happen. And every time we use uh, anytime we're doing one of these success-failure problems, we're going to want to have all three of those pieces. Now let's go ahead and calculate this one out. So on the calculator, what that's going to look like is 10 times 18 out of 38 raised to the third times 20 out of 38 raised to the second. That may look a little weird the way I've written it down, but that's the way it's going to look in the calculator. And I did use the fractions instead of the decimal because the uh, decimal has some rounding error in it, so I'd rather have the exact answer of the fraction for doing this work. So 10 times parentheses 18 over 38. That needs to be in parentheses before we raise it to the power. Otherwise, you would just end up raising the denominator to the third. And then times 20 over 38, also raised to the second power. And then what do we get there? approximately 0.2944. So we've just computed the probability that if you played roulette five times, betting on red every time, that you would end up uh, winning three of them, and it's about a 29.5% chance. Alright, so what we want to do next is figure out how could we have figured out this 10 without having to list all the possibilities, because that's the part that, even once you're good at this, would be a pain, would be to have to list every way it could happen. 
Uh, I used a pattern here, but even then it's still kind of nerve-wracking to think, did I get everyone? Did I miss something? Did I count something twice? So, and it's annoying also to make all this chart, and all you really need from it is the number of ways, 10. You didn't really even need to see all the pieces. So to answer this question, let's jump down to the bottom and look at another one, and I'll try and um, talk you through it down here. So consider playing roulette nine times and betting on red and trying to find the probability of five wins. So we're switching things up a little bit. It's nine plays now, not just five. And then instead of three wins, we're looking at five wins. So one of the ways this could happen would be that I could win the first five, and then I could lose the four after that. And if I wanted to represent that down here, I could say that would be P to the fifth to represent the five times that I win. And then I would have Q to the fourth, because if in nine plays I win five, then there'd still be four losses. But if I just stopped right there, I'm not getting the probability of five wins in any order. I'm getting five wins in this specific order. To get all the different orders, if you look back up here, I have to multiply by the number of different ways that could happen. So I could start listing them. I've listed one. I could start listing more. Win, 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 loss, win, loss, loss, loss. Now I'm up to two of them, but I'd have to make this whole list until I had every possibility. And however many different ways there were for, for me to do this, that's what would go out front. So what I want to do instead of listing them is think it through. So I want to think about having nine plays, and then I'm going to choose five of those to be the successes, and then the losses would just fill in the other four spots. So I don't need to list them, I just need to think how many ways are there from these nine blanks to choose five to be the wins. So listen to those words carefully again. I need to think about from these nine blanks how many ways are there to choose five to put the successes in. And the answer to that, as you might be thinking as you're listening to me there, is nine choose five. From the nine blanks, we're choosing five to be the successes. So rather than having to list them all out, I can take the number of plays, nine, choose the number of wins, five, and use that as my multiplier. So let's go ahead and write that out now. This is the way it would look on the calculator. Nine, NCR, which is our choose, five, times P, which is 18 out of 38, raised to the fifth, times 20 out of 38, which is Q, raised to the fourth. And let's go ahead and enter all that in. So, 9, math, probability, choose 5, times... 18 over 38 to the 5th times 20 over 38 to the 4th. And when I do that, I get the probability of 5 wins is approximately 0 0.2306. Alright, so we do need that answer, but I also really what I wanted to get there is the formula. And so it looks like the answer to that question up above, how could we have figured out the 10 without listing the possibilities? Well, on that one, we had five different plays, and we were trying to choose which three of them would have gotten the, the wins. So it should have been five, choose three. Now, if that's correct, we'll get the 10. So let's test that real quick. Five, math, probability, choose three, and we do get the 10. So instead of having to list out all those possibilities, I could have just done five choose three, and the same thing was true down here. Instead of um, continuing this list on, I could just do nine choose five. And by the way, that's a good thing that we have a shortcut because nine choose five is 126. So I only had two out of the 126 possible orders, so there was a lot more writing to do if I was going to show it all. All right, so now we want to go ahead and take all of that and build it into the binomial probability formula. So here's our formula for success-failure problems. The binomial probability formula, the requirements for using it is you need n identical trials. So you have to be doing something over and over again, like flipping a coin or playing roulette. 
There needs to be two possible outcomes for each trial, but we've seen that's not as restrictive as it might sound. In fact, if you think about a roulette wheel as 38 slots, and yet we made it success failure by saying either the ball lands in a red one or it doesn't. The trials need to be independent, and the probability of success needs to remain the same from trial to trial. If you realize you're in that situation, then here's the steps you want to do to do probability. First, identify a success, and that is whatever is being counted. So we counted wins, but somebody might decide to count losses. So whatever is being counted is considered the success. And then determine n, which is the number of trials. p, the probability of a success. And q, the probability of failure. And then once you have all those pieces, once you know n, p, and q, if you want the probability of x successes, then you would take the number of trials, choose the number of successes you want, times the probability of success raised to the number of successes, times the probability of failure raised to the number of failures, which would be the number of plays minus the number of successes. And if you look at that, that does work for this one right here. We had nine plays and wanted five wins, so n choose x was nine choose five. Then we took the probability of success and raised it to the fifth power, because we wanted five wins. And then for the number of losses, we did 9 minus 5 and got the leftover 4, so that was n minus x right there. A few things worth noting. Um, when we say that it's the number of trials, that's true, but it could also be plays or sample size. Those are common things that get used for success-failure problems. And then when we talk about the probability of success, this is in any one try. So when I was doing the probability of success down here for roulette, I didn't consider that I wanted five wins or nine plays. I just said if I were to play roulette just one time, what's my chance of winning? 18 out of 38. So the biggest mistake people make when they're trying to figure out their N, P, and Q is for P to try and incorporate the N and the X in there somehow, and that does not apply. You just think, what if I only did this one time? What's the chance I would su succeed then? And so if you go back and look at the top, we figured out the probability of getting a red number before we even knew how many times we were playing or how many wins we wanted. It was just based on what's on the wheel and how many of those were successes. All right, so we're going to go ahead and see the rest of this on the next page. All right, so we want to go ahead and continue on the example from the previous page. On the previous page, we looked at the probability that a gambler who was playing the game of roulette nine times, betting on red every time, would end up winning exactly five of those. And that's an interesting one to look at, but I think if you were a gambler, the more interesting question would be, what's the probability that you would end up winning money? And if you won five out of four, you would win money, but there's other ways that could happen too. So to help us answer this question of what's the probability of winning money, I'm going to introduce a new variable. So I'm going to let x equal the number of wins. And I want to think about how many times would you have to win at roulette out of the nine if you wanted to end up winning money. So there's a couple quick things you need to know about the game. And this isn't something you have to worry about for tests. But if you were playing roulette uh, and you're betting a color like red, then it pays even money. And that means that if you bet a dollar and you win, you win a dollar. There's other things you can do, like bet a number, and if you bet on the number, say, 17, and that number comes up, and you bet $1, you get your dollar back plus 35 of theirs, so we would say that that pays 35 to 1. But when you bet a color, you get your dollar back plus just one of theirs, so it pays 1 to 1. So in that situation, if you wanted to win money, and if you were betting the same amount each time, which we're going to assume here, then you have to win at least half. So the probability of winning money becomes the probability that x would be greater than or equal to 5. And just thinking that through real quick, why is that? If you win 5 times, then you lose 4. So you'd win $5 on your wins, you'd lose back 4 on your losses, and you'd be plus 1. 
Of course, if you won six, seven, eight, nine times, since that's more wins, you would also win money. But if you only won four times, you would win $4 from them, but then you would lose $5 back on the other plays and be down $1. So anything five or higher would work out um, to win money. So what does that mean? To win five or more means that the number of wins is five or six or seven or eight or nine. So any of those would do the trick. So what we're going to do on this is separate those out and say what's the probability of five wins plus the probability of six wins plus the probability of seven, eight, and nine wins. And we'll do each one of those separately and add them together. Just a quick comment on that. To turn an or into an addition, it has to be a mutually exclusive or. And if x is the total number of wins, your total can't be 5 and 6 at the same time. Your total number of wins could be 5 or 6 or 3 or 0, but it can't be two different answers when x is the total number of wins out of the 9 plays. So now what we want to do is find each of these 5 and add them together. How do you do any one of these? Well, we just did the probability of 5 wins on the previous page. So let me bring that back in. To do the probability of 5 wins, we did the 9 choose 5, p to the 5th, q to the 4th, and we got an answer for that of 0 0.2306. So I'm going to copy that over. And that was the probability of 5 wins. So now we want to add the probability of 6 wins onto that, and I'll show the scratch work for that down here. For 6 wins, we'd want from the 9 plays, we want to choose the 6 that would be the wins. Take the probability of winning when you're betting red, 18 out of 38, and raise that to the 6th. And take the probability of losing, 20 out of 38, and raise that to the 3rd. So very similar to what we did on the previous page. And I'll bring in the calculator and make that calculation. So we want to do 9, math, probability, choose 6 times, remember parentheses around your P and Q if they're fractions, so 18 over 38 raised to the 6th times 20 over 38 raised to the 3rd. And press enter on that and we get our probability of 6 wins. So approximately 0.1383. Okay, so that's probability of 6 wins, 0.1383. So now we have two of the five pieces we need, and we want to just keep going and getting the additional ones. So to do that, I would just make some changes. If I wanted the probability of seven wins, I would change this to a seven. That means this would change to a seven. This would change to a seven. And if I won seven out of nine, the leftovers would be the losses, which would be the nine minus seven or two. And then that's going to change our answer. So we'll go to the calculator again and see what we get. So what I want to do is bring the calculator in and since that's just a modification of the last time I'm going to hit second and enter and just make those same changes I made on paper on the calculator. So it's going to be 9 choose 7, p raised to the seventh power and q is now raised to the second power and then press enter and I get that next one for p of 7. So moving that out of, way, out of the way and copying that down, 0 0.0534, and now we have P of 7. And now I just want to take that and repeat it for P of 8. So 9 choose 8, P to the 8, and Q to the 1st, so plus 0 0.0120, and then we're just left with P of 9 which would be 9 choose 9, p to the ninth, and if there's 9 wins then there's 0 losses. And kind of coincidentally that looks a lot like the last one. That really is just a coincidence that the decimal ended up moving there. And so there we go. So we've got the probability 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 all figured out. All using this formula, even though I didn't write every one of them out. It's once you've written one out, you're just making changes for the rest. So your probability of winning money, 
just comes from totaling all that up. So the probability of winning money when you play roulette nine times, betting on red every time is, and then let's see. So we just add all those together. So 0 0.2306 plus 0 0.1383, 0534, 0120, and 0012. And have a mistake there. Let's see if we can catch that. Uh, I forgot a zero right there. So if you have a digit missing, instead of starting over, you can hit second enter. And you can go to where you wish you had the zero, which is right there. And I can hit second and insert. And that way when I type the zero, everything slides to the right instead of just typing over it. So that's a nice trick to know anytime you act missed a digit and want to insert it back in. You don't have to start over. So now this total makes more sense for me, 0 0.4355. So there's our probability of winning money if we were to play roulette nine times, betting the same amount on red each time. All right, so let's look at the next part, part C. We want to figure out what's the probability that you'd end up losing money. So to lose money, uh, you would have to win four or less times. Just thinking about the dis discussion we had earlier, if you only won four, you win four dollars and then you lose back five, so you're down one. And if you lost three, two, one, or zero times, it would be even worse for you. So we could do the probability of zero, one, two, three, and four, and add all those together. And that would work. And we just do it just like we did here. We'd use this formula five more times using these numbers as our input. But what would be easier is to notice that that is the complement of what we did before. And so we can just subtract away that probability that x is greater than or equal to five from up above and say that our answer is approximately one minus that 0.4355. And doing that subtraction from one, we get 0.5 six, four, five. So there's just a real quick calculation of the probability of losing money. Instead of using the formula, I realize that's the complement of what I had done up above, and that way I get a really fast answer for that. Now one of the things I want you to notice here is that if we go back to the starting P and Q values we had earlier, if you were to play roulette once, your chance of winning money is the same as the chance of success, 0.4737 and your chance of losing is 20 out of 38. That's a 5% difference roughly. But if instead of just playing roulette once, you play nine times, then you have a 43.5% chance of winning money, 56.45% chance of losing money. That's about a 13% difference. This is really common in gambling games that if the casino has an edge, then the more times you play, the less likely it is you'll win money and the more likely it is that you'll lose money. In fact, if you were to let this like, number of plays go, go to 90 plays, 900 plays, 9,000 plays, your probability of winning money will get closer and closer to zero and your probability of losing money will get really close to one. So the casino's goal is just to get you to play a lot of times and then the math is totally in their favor that you'll end up losing money and they'll end up winning money. So most of their strategies in a casino are about just trying to get you to stay and keep playing because they know if they do that, the gap widens and they have a bigger and bigger advantage over you. All right, so I think the roulette example is an interesting one and it, it actually really works well with this formula to do the roulette because you have this constant probability of success and failure. But we're supposed to be looking at this idea of success and failure so that we can apply it to inferential statistics. And when we do that, we're gonna be applying it a lot of times to sampling questions. So I want to show you how things change when we do start moving to sampling. And unfortunately, uh, it, when we make the change, some of our assumptions that we need get violated. So when most people do sampling for polls, they do the sampling without replacement. And that means the probability of success depends on previous picks. Because every time you take a person out that was a success, now you're a little less likely to get a success the next time. If you take somebody out that is a failure, you're more likely to get a success the next time. So it just keeps kind of adjusting around depending on what happened on previous picks. When that happens, this binomial formula that we're using above 
no longer perfectly applies. It becomes something called a hypergeometric distribution, and that's a much more complicated one to work with. But it turns out that the change is pretty minor, and maybe we can stick with the binomial and not have to learn this new distribution. And I just want to show you why that's the case. So if you were to do your sampling with replacement, you would get constant probability of success, and the formula that we just used for roulette would work perfectly. Without replacement, it gets flawed a little. So I want to compare the two methods and see how close the answers are. So suppose we had a population that had 22,000 men and 18,000 women in it. So that's 40,000 people altogether. And suppose that we were going to choose three people and that it was going to be with replacement. What's the probability that we would get all men? So we want the probability of man on the first pick and a man on the second pick and a man on the third pick. And what we would do with this is just uh, use the multiplication rule and go through from left to right. So what's the probability of a man on the first pick? Well, there's 22,000 men in this population and 40,000 men, or sorry, 40,000 people altogether. So that's our, our chance of getting a man on the first pick. When we go to the second pick, it's actually still the same thing. And that throws people at first a lot. But the reason it's the same is because the sampling's with replacement. So when we choose that guy, we don't take him out of the population. He's still there. And so when we choose the next person, that guy's still available and there's still 40,000 people there. If you're expecting the numbers to go down here, that's what happens when it's without replacement. And we'll do that in a moment. So when you go to what's the probability that I'll get a third man given that I've gotten two so far, because we keep putting the people back on the third pick, it's still a 22,000 out of 40,000 chance that we'll get a man. And so when we go to calculate that on the calculator, it's actually nice that all those are the same because we can just go ahead and take that 22,000 over 40,000 and multiply it with itself three times, but that would mean raise it to the third power. So when we do that, we get 0 0.166375. Now normally we only write four decimals on a probability, that, but this is exact at six, and I want to show you like where the differences occur, so I'm going to go ahead and write all of those down. Okay, so now let's go back and do the question again, but this time without replacement, and see how that changes things. So the question itself is still the same. We want to know what's the probability that all three of the people picked would be men. And the chance the first one would be a man is still 22,000 out of 40,000. But when we get to that second one, now because it's without replacement, when we go in the second time, there's only 39,999 people left to choose from. And given that the first one was a man, there'd be one less man in that group too, so it goes to 21,999 as the numerator. That's the difference between with and without replacement. And then when you go in there for the third time, now there's 39,998 people left because we've chosen twice without replacement. And given the first two were men, the chance you'd get another man has a numerator of 21,998. So unfortunately, this one's a lot messier to put in the calculator, but we're just going to use the same kind of idea, uh, except for we can't use the cube this time. So we have to just go ahead and work it through from left to right. So 22,000 over 40,000 times 21,999 over 39,999 times 21,998 over 39,998. So no real shortcut for that. You just got to put all those numbers in one at a time and just be patient with it. So because I put six decimals on the last one, I'm going to do that again. So this would be 166 six, and then 365. And what I always say when I'm face to face with you guys on this is I would say like, oh, look, these are totally different answers. And of course, that's an exaggeration. They're a little bit different. And the difference doesn't occur until you get out into the fifth decimal place. So when you're doing sampling, does it matter whether the sampling is with or without replacement? Well, technically, yes, it does. You can see the different math involved. But when you think about the answers, they're basically the same. We usually would write our probabilities to only four decimal places, and this would be 0.1664, rounding up because of the 7. This one would also be 0.1664. So it doesn't make that big of a difference if you're taking a small sample out of a big group. And this note here kind of 
summarizes for us when when is it okay to just go ahead and treat the sampling as if it were with replacement and use the binomial formula like we did for roulette versus where would that not work and we would have to go to this hypergeometric thing. So here's our note. Even if sampling is done without replacement, you can still use the binomial formula to get good approximations of probabilities for success failure problems as long as the sample size is less than 5% of the population. The idea is if you start sampling too big of a chunk of your population and you're doing it without replacement, then because you've taken so many people out, the probabilities might start shifting in a dramatic way where your answers become further apart. But that, that shouldn't be too much of a concern as long as your sample size is less than 5% of the population. Now, when they do opinion polls on people in the U.S., they usually use a sample size of around 1,500. And if you thought about the population of U.S. adults, about 330 million people in the U.S., if you were just concerned with adults, maybe it's at least 200 million. 1,500 people divided by 200, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 zeros there after that. 1,500 divided by 200 million is in scientific notation, 7.5 E negative 6. That means there's five zeros and then a 7. So 0 0.05 would be 5%. So we're nowhere close to 5% in that situation. Another way you could look at it is if you had 200 million and you took 5% of that, that's 10 million people. So unless your sample size was over 10 million, you wouldn't be close to violating this rule. So in most real life situations, we don't get anywhere near this 5% of the population. So even though we'll do our sampling without replacement, we'll be able to treat it as if it was with replacement. And that means probabilities can still be calculated using this formula. And I'll show you an example of that on the next page. All right, finishing up this section, let's go ahead and take a look at an example now where we're gonna try and apply this success failure idea to a problem that involves sampling. So according to a July 2011 New York Times article called A History of College Grade Inflation, only 15% of the grades given to college students in 1960 were A grades. Suppose that we randomly selected 42 students from 1960 and we let X be the number that had received an A grade in a randomly selected course. So just a quick note, a problem that's referring to selecting students from 1960 might seem a little out of date. Notice the article is a little bit more recent, 2011. There's a reason we're going back to that older time and we'll, we'll see that as we finish up the problem. But what would be considered a success? So a success is always that you see the trait that you were looking for. So if X is the number that had received an A grade, then anytime you see somebody who received an A grade, that would be a success. And we're gonna look at 42 people, and we're gonna look at them one at a time and say, is this one a success or not? So if the course selected from the person selected was an A grade, that's what would be a success. So remember, we're sampling these people in, from 1960, so you know maybe this is your grandfather or something. So we, we pick the, him, and then we look at his transcripts, and we randomly pick a course. If that course ends up being an A, we'd say it was a success. If it's anything else, we'd say it was a failure. So determine N, P, and Q. So N is the number of trials, which in a sampling situation is always the sample size. So we're asking 42 college students this question. So the maximum number of successes we could get is 42. And that's another way to think of N is what's the top number of successes I could get in this experiment. And then P would be the probability that the person that we are about to select would end up having an A on the course we select. Well, if those, the person, the people we're talking about are college students from 1960, then according to the New York Times article, 15% of those students or grades given back then were A's. So we're essentially randomly looking at a course grade. 15% of those are A's. So there's a 15% chance or the probability is 0.15 that a randomly selected course grade would be an A. Q is the probability that it wouldn't be an A and that's always 1 minus the probability of success. So 1 minus 0.15 is 0.85.
So there's our NP and Q, always essential to know NP and Q when you're doing a problem about success failure. Even if they don't ask you for it, you need to write it down because you will use it somewhere. Now, find the probability that 16 of those selected received an A in the course that we looked at for them. Well, because it's a success failure problem, when you go to do the probability, you use our success failure formula, which is the binomial probability formula. You're going to take the number of trials, 42, choose the number of successes you're looking for, 16, you're going to take the probability of success and raise it to the number of successes, which is 16. Take the probability of failure and raise it to the probability of failure, which would be 42 minus 16, which is 26. You can always make sure that these two add up back to the 42. The number of successes and the number of failures should total the number of trials. And then at that point, you go to the calculator. If you try and do this uh, probability any way other than using this formula, it's going to be too complicated to really figure out in a reasonable amount of time. So let's slide that over, bring in the calculator, clear out this old stuff, and get this entered in. So 42, math, probability, choose 16 times the probability of success raised to the 16th times the probability of failure raised to the 26th. You actually don't need parentheses around your P and Q when they're decimals, only when they're fractions, but it doesn't hurt if you do it either. So either way is okay. And this one comes out a little weird. This E negative four is a strange answer perhaps. Uh, but that's a scientific notation symbol that tells us we need to move our decimal point four spots to the left. So that means the first move would be past the one, the next three would be zero. So it's zero, 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 one, five, nine, eight, seven, nine, something like that. But typically, when we write probabilities, we just write four decimals. So you could also say the probability that x equals 16, which is the symbolic form of their question, is approximately 0 0.0002. That would be the standard way we would answer the probability is with four decimals. If you wanted to put more, you could. And sometimes it's useful to do that before you round when you're coming out of scientific notation. So come out of scientific notation first and think about rounding second can make it a little bit more likely that you'll, you'll get there smoothly. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the next part of that question. Find the probability that at least three of those selected received an A in the course. So because of the at least, we're going to write that with an inequality. At least three successes is three or more. So you could write that this is the probability that X is greater than or equal to three. And if you think about what that means, that's three successes or four successes or five successes all the way up to N, which would be 42 successes. So if we were going to do it that way, we would have to calculate each of these using this formula and going from P of 3 to P of 42 would actually be 40 times we would have to use that formula. Good news, we already did one of them, only 39 left to go, right? So that good news doesn't seem that great. That would be a ton of work to do. And we could do it, it would work. But it would be better, since we're going to add so many that way, to consider the complement rule and say, what if we did, instead of x is greater than or equal to 3, instead of adding all the stuff we want, what if we subtracted the ones that we don't want? Two successes, one success, and zero successes. Those are the things that are not listed here. So we could add up what you do want or you could subtract what you don't. And there's a huge advantage to doing it this way because we only have to use this formula three times instead of 40. And then we could start filling in the numbers by going to the calculator. So I'm gonna pull up what we did last time. And I wanna change this to calculating the probability of two successes. So to do that, I'm gonna hit second enter and make it and choose x, which would be a 0, 2 in that case. p is going to be raised to the second because we want two successes. And two successes out of 42 tries means 40 failures. So n choose x, p to the x, q to the n minus x, the leftovers. And we get 
point, I'm oh, sorry, we still need to carry over that one. One minus the probability of two, which is 0 0.0291. And then now we wanna move on and do the probability of one. So second enter, change that to one success, both in the choose and the P to the number of successes. And if there's only one success, there must be 41 failures. So P of one is 0, 0, 0080. 0. And then we also need the P of zero part. So we'll do one more. Second enter and choose zero, P to the zero. And if there's no successes, then all 42 are failures. So zero, zero, one, one. It's a one, but followed by an eight. So the probability that X is greater than or equal to three. Sorry about that, move that over a little bit for you. So there was our P of uh, one answer written fully, and there's the P of zero completely written out. And now we want to just put all that into the calculator. So 1 minus 0 0.0291 minus 0 0.0080 minus 0 0.0011. Subtracting out the probabilities we don't want leaves us with what would, should be the total of the 40 that we do, 0.9618. I think it's really important to notice here that I use the complement rule, but there's nowhere in the directions that said use the complement rule to find this. So if you're doing this on a test and you do it this way, you'll get it right, but you will take about 13 times as long as somebody who used the complement rule, and it would be nice to save that time for some other problem. So anytime you're adding up more than half of the possibilities, you should always think about subtracting out the things you don't want instead of adding up the ones that you do. And a lot of times like here, that creates a much shorter pathway for us. Even though no one said to do it that way, we should choose to do it that way because it speeds things up so much. All right, so we're gonna continue on with this problem, but they're gonna ask us about the mean and standard deviation. And that can be a really tough thing to compute for a binomial distribution because we normally would start off with an X and P of X column, but X uh, would be the number of successes and it can go from zero all the way up to 42. So if we did this the way we did in the previous section, we would have 43 rows to our table. And then filling in all the probabilities would mean using the formula 43 times, and then we'd still have all the work of doing the formula. But thankfully, when you're doing success failure problems, NPQ problems, binomial distribution, all different words for the same thing, there are shortcut formulas. And the shortcut formula for the mean of a binomial random variable is all you have to do is take n times p. And the standard deviation for a binomial distribution turns out to be the square root of n times p times q. To come up with these formulas takes a lot of really messy algebra, but to use them is very simple. And the key thing to notice is that there's not that capital sigma in these formulas. When you see that capital sigma, you're going to be doing sums, which means you're probably going to make a table. When that's missing, you're just doing a quick computation. So I'll show you how to use that on this um, problem that we've been working on up here. Um, but first, let's just fill in a note. Uh, if you're doing an NPQ problem, we should always use these new shortcut formulas if somebody asks us for the mean and standard deviation. It just cuts the work time down by an amazing amount. For NP and Q random variables, uh, Sorry, for non-NP and Q random variables, we can't use these. So if it's not success failure, you still have to use the method from the previous section, which is the sum of the X, P of X's for the mean. And the standard deviation would be the square root of the sum of the values of X minus the values of mu of X squared times the P of X's. And the good news when you have to go that way, we learned in section 5.4, we can use our calculator to do most of that work for us. But even then, we would still have to figure out the values of P of X 43 times to fill them into our calculator before we could let the calculator take over. So for an NPQ problem, we don't wanna go this way, we wanna go this way. So just a quick note on that. Uh, an example of one where you'd have to do these formulas if you let x be the sum of two dice, 
that is not a repetition problem. We're not rolling the dice over and over again. We're just rolling them once, and if we get a 3 and a 5, x is 8. For a problem like that, we have to um, come up with a probability distribution and then use these formulas on that to get the mean and standard deviation, or use our calculator to do that for us. But if we were to roll the two dice 100 times and say let x be the number of times we got a 7, now we have the repetition, 100 rolls, and a success that we rolled a 7 where we could find the p and q and use the shortcut formulas. All right, so we're going to go ahead and turn the page and we're going to apply these new shortcut formulas to this um, problem about A grades from 1960. All right, so let's go ahead and give those new formulas a, a try on this problem. So part E, find the mean and standard deviation for the number of A's in our sample of 42 courses selected from 1960. So if we want to find the mean, the mean of the X's should be N times P. N is 42 on this problem, and the probability of success on any one try was 0.15. So all you have to do to get the mean, no table, no really complicated formulas, just a quick multiplication. 42 times 0 0.015, and sorry, I've got an extra zero in there. 42 times 0 0.15, and we get 6.3. So very quick, be careful of typos apparently, but very quick to get your mean. And the standard deviation is almost as easy. The standard deviation is the square root of n times p times q. So that's going to be the square root of 42 times 0 0.15 times q, which is 1 minus that, 0 0.85. But still, that's just a quick entry into the calculator. No tables, no anything real complicated. And the only thing you have to remember is it's the square root of all that stuff but the calculator should open the parentheses for you. Just don't close those until you get all three of those numbers in there. So the square root of n times p times q and then close the parentheses. And then there's our standard deviation, 2.3141. Putting a one because of the eight after the zero and going that far because on standard deviations we want one, two, three, four, five digits as a minimum. So there's your mean and standard deviation. You should notice that's much faster than what we were doing in section 5.4. And we're only able to use these shortcuts and make it go so fast because it was a success failure problem or an NPQ problem. So now that we've got those means and standard deviations calculated so quickly, let's go ahead and use some of the extra time to do a follow-up question. So would it be considered unusual if 18 of those selected had received an A, a grade in the specified course. So when somebody asks me would it be unusual if, my mind goes to calculating a z-score so I can see how many standard deviations away from the mean that would be. So I take the number they asked about, 18, I subtract the mean, 6.3, I divide by the standard deviation, 2.3141, and just kind of looking at that in my head, that seems like those are really far apart. But let's bring in the calculator and double check that. So parentheses around the top, 18 minus 6.3 divided by 2.3141. And we get a z-score of 5.05. .05, and then that's a 5 but followed by a 9. So we'll put 6. Remember I'm picky here, exactly three decimal places on our z-score. So I'll leave it just like that. And then we just want to think about our answer and write it out. So would it be unusual if we got 18 A's out of the 42 grades? Well, that would be over five standard deviations away from the mean, and anything over two would be unusual. So, yes, 18 A's would be unusual. Because it is more than two standard deviations away from the mean. So you could say it differently if you want. Um, you could say, yes, 18 A's in fact would be very unusual because it's more than three standard deviations away from the mean. But if you want to keep it simple, just yes or no, two is our cutoff for that. All right, let's go ahead and look at the follow-up to that. And this is where we're going to bring things up to more recent times instead of staying back there in 1960. 
So suppose that we randomly sampled 42 college students from 2012, and we found that 18 of them had received A grades in a specified course, in the specified course. Would you say that it seems plausible that 15% of college grades are still A's, just like it was back in 1960, and that the reason we got this higher number of A's, 18, is just due to random variation? Or would you consider this to be strong evidence that the percentage of A grades given in college courses has increased since 1960 and explain. So they're only giving us two choices here. This is a complicated question, but it is multiple choice. And if we were going to say that we thought it was uh, could just be due to random variation, that it's still 15% of A, A course grades are A's, then we would have expected about 6.3 A's, but maybe the 18 A's is just random variation, right? But to believe that, we have to believe that just due to random variation, we landed over five standard deviations away from the mean, and we know that that would be very unusual. So our philosophy here is we're only gonna go with random variation as a plausible explanation, as a reasonable explanation, if the z-score for that would be under two. If it's over two, we're gonna seek an, ex an alternative explanation, and in this case, they've given us an option that the other option, if it's not random variation, then it's strong evidence that the percentage of A, grade, A grades given in college courses has increased since 1960. So I can't go with random variation because I was more than two standard deviations away from the mean, so I'm going to go with the other option. So let's see how we'd write that out. Because 18 A's is more than two standard deviations away from the mean. It is not plausible or reasonable, if you like that word better, that 15% of grades in 2012 are A's. So what's the other option? We would consider this to be strong evidence that the percentage of A grades given in college has increased. Now this is a tough question. This is in fact kind of a chapter nine question. So we're just sort of previewing a future topic here. So don't stress over this too much as you're looking at this example or doing homework, but it is an idea that you wanna start thinking about to make those later chapters easier. And here's the decision rule that I used on this. If you have a z-score whose absolute value is less than two, so anything in between negative two and positive two, then you could go ahead and conclude that it is a reasonable possibility that the difference you observed in your sample was just due to random variation. But we will not go with random variation as our explanation if the absolute value of that z-score is over 2, so anything bigger than 2 or smaller than negative 2. So if you get a z-score like that, then you should consider this strong evidence that a different explanation is needed. So on the problem up above, they asked us about 18 A's. Um, could that just be random variation? That's over five standard deviations away from the mean. So that means it's not a reasonable possibility that it's random. We're in this category. Our absolute value of Z was definitely over two at five, right? And so that's strong evidence that a different explanation is needed. And the different explanation they provided is that there's more A's given in college now than there was back in 1960, and that actually explains why the New York Times article was entitled A History of College Grade Inflation. So it, it's left us to speculate as to why more A's are given, 
but the evidence seems to support the idea that more A's are given now and in 2015, as I record this, or whatever year you watch it, than there were back in 1960. All right, that wraps up chapter five.